Greetings. How are you? I hope that you've had a good week and have taken some time to be in God's Word. Uh, your weeks will always go better when you're in God's Word, I guarantee it. And God likes it too. No, he loves it when you're in God's Word, when you're in His Word. God's Word, this Holy Bible, the Scriptures, it's His love letter to us. You know, if someone that you love sends you a letter, don't you always open it first before the bills, the promotional things that you get and all that other junk that we get in the mail? You carefully open it and you certainly open it before the uh, magazines, don't you? Uh, and you may not even carefully, it may rip it open. You wanna see it. Well, do the same thing with God's word. Tear it open each morning and soak up every word. It'll change your life and give you joy and peace, not to mention lead you to salvation. I want to give a shout out to uh, Dustin. Um, Dustin is a, a good friend of mine, and he and I visited this week, and he has been reading God's Word daily, and he keeps up, and it's really blessed his life. So, good job, Dustin. Well, let's get right to our study on the parables of Jesus. Um, but first, uh, I'd like to pray for us. Father, you and you alone are God. I'm not, and neither is anyone viewing this. Uh, I'm thankful for that because, uh, Lord, I can't even operate my own life without you, much less trying to operate and manage others' lives. Open now uh, this powerful, pure, and precious word of yours, your love letter to us, your operator's manual for these lives that you've graciously given us. In our Lord Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, last week in our introductory study to the parables of Jesus, we set the stage or at least the backdrop uh, to when and why our Lord began teaching in parables. And um, by way of review, we saw several things that are, signif are significant uh, for us to know about the when and why of parables. Because unless one carefully and meticulously studies them in Scripture, we can easily miss or overlook some very important things about the parables. Uh, which in actually, actuality uh, casts a whole new light uh, upon why Jesus used parables when he taught in public after that certain point in his ministry that we began looking at last week. You remember last week uh, we discussed that it was early in Jesus's three plus year ministry that he taught in a more conventional and traditional way, drawing his teachings from the Old Testament and giving discourses on Old Testament scriptures. He would quote from the law of Moses, um, from the prophets, from the history of the Hebrews, uh, and from Psalms and so forth. And we saw also then uh, one day, and we, we zeroed in on that last week, all of that changed in his ministry. It's about two years into his ministry. And uh, we looked at it in detail at the events of that day that led to his apostles coming to him and asking him, as is captured in Matthew 13, 10, they came to him after he'd spoken these parables that day. Why do you speak, they asked Jesus, to the people in parables? And the answer he gave them, which uh, we really um, didn't get to study last week because of time, and I want to quickly cover that now. It's found in the very next passage that we didn't read in chapter 13 of Matthew. Uh, and I want to pick up with verses 11 through 13. So turn there or, or listen. And this is in response to them asking him, you know, why do you speak to them in parables? He, his reply, he replied, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you but not to them. Whoever has will be given more and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. 
This is why I speak to them in parables. Listen up. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. And um, so powerful verses there. So the answer to their question of why did he now start speaking and teaching him parables? What, what was it? Well, it was because the Pharisees had refused to believe in the signs and the miracles that Jesus had been performing over and over again in their very presence. And so their hearts had been hardened by their unbelief. They needed a little dose of the man who brought his demon-possessed son to Jesus to be healed that we find over in Mark 9, verses 22 to 24. Um, and I'm going to turn there real quickly because this is the attitude that those Pharisees should have had. It would have made things much different. Listen to what that father of that demon-possessed boy that he brought to Jesus to be healed said. After they had talked for a while, Jesus had engaged him in a conversation. Um, in verse 22, uh, he says, the man says to Jesus, but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus says in the next verse, if you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief exclamation point. Wow. What's the difference between that man that we read about in Mark chapter nine and the Pharisees that we have been reading about back over in chapter Matthew, chapter 13 of Matthew. That man in Mark, he wanted to believe. On the other hand, the Pharisees back over in Matthew, they didn't want to believe because Jesus was on to them. He knew their hearts. Remember, he was God in the flesh. He knew they were full of pride. They were religious phonies. They were hypocrites. He'd even called them out numerous times, telling them that very thing. Everything they did was for the purpose of being seen by others in public. You can find that over Matthew 23, 5. And they loved the best seats, Jesus said, in the synagogues. That's over in Luke eleven forty three. They were so full of pride, they were blind to truth. That truth, which by the way, and ironically stood right before them in the very flesh. And more on their blindness in today's parable that we'll be taking a look at here, hopefully in a few minutes. And it was in their blindness caused by their pride and their unbelief and their refusal to believe the hardness of their hearts and guess what? It was prophetic. It was prophesied in the Old Testament by the prophet Isaiah back in chapter 6, verses 9 and 10 of Isaiah. Uh, and Jesus quotes that. So I'm going to go back to, uh, in his explanation of why he spoke to them in parables, he continues on. And, he's, and it was to fill prophecy. I want to read verses 14 and 15. This is the very next two verses. This is Jesus speaking. He says, in them, referring to these um, hard-hearted Pharisees, the prophecy of Isaiah, quote, he gives it here, you will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts and turn and I would heal them. Isn't that something? But look, he continues on. Look at how Jesus blesses his disciples. Uh, and I believe that would have included the 12 apostles and any other believers or followers. Not It would exceed just those 12 chosen. It would include those others because there were multitudes of others. In fact, I think in one place we see that there were a group of what he called disciples that numbered about 125. But listen to what he says to them and how he says that they'll be blessed. This is in verses 16 and 17. But blessed are your eyes, he tells his disciples, 
because they see and your ears because they hear. And this is, it just gives me goosebumps. For I tell you the truth, he tells them, many prophets and righteous men long to see what you see, but did not see it. And to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Wow. How privileged and a special time it was for him. You see, after Jesus would speak to the crowds from that point on, uh, which mostly included Pharisees and a lot of other religious elite and unbelievers, Jesus would then later explain in detail the meaning of the parable or parables that he had used. Go over to Mark chapter four. I think this is the best of the three synoptic gospels to explain what I'm talking about here is how he'd call them together to explain it. Mark chapter four, verses 33 and 34 says, with many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. This is, of course, after that day we studied last week, and it was actually, this is Mark's version of it here. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. Wow, what a privilege to be taught. And we have that same privilege today in his word. Another thing we looked at last week we studied was that Jesus is speaking in public only in parables after that fateful day and running in with the Pharisees when they accused him, if you recall, of being an instrument of Satan. They called him Beelzebub. Jesus basically brought judgment upon them. And as we've seen today, that was done to fulfill not only the judgment that he was worthy, that they were worthy of because they're hardened hearts, but it also fulfilled Old Testament prophecy. It was judgment because parables illustrate or show a spiritual truth always. But in most, if not all cases, the spiritual truths must be explained and taught. That's why Jesus met later after he had given or used the parable to explain its meaning. And as we just clearly saw was the case there in Mark chapter four that we just looked at, then he would alone with them later, uh, with his followers would explain everything. Well, he had explained to those who believed and wanted to believe as that man that we looked about over in Mark chapter nine, who brought his demon possessed son. I do believe he cried out, help me overcome my unbelief. Parables to unbelievers were not then and they're not now clear. They hide truth in riddles. And this is judgment on final unbelief. Again, this is why Jesus began from this fateful day forward to speak in and teach safe, uh, uh, solely in public with and by parables. But consider this, Jesus, was also merciful to him in this judgment. And you might ask, well, how, how can you say that in judgment he was also merciful? It sounds like double talk to me. Well, that's a good question. And this is a deep issue and we have to look deep to see it, but it's there. And I wanna to try to explain that to you a little bit. The element of mercy in this judgment is that if Jesus continued speaking to the Pharisees and other unbelievers in the crowd in clear, unmistakable terms and kept explaining the scriptures to them and proclaiming clear doctrinal truth to them and they continued to refuse to believe, what would happen? Their culpability would also increase. In other words, they'd be held more accountable for what they had heard and knew better, but still chose to disbelieve. You know, we may have heard someone say something like this, you're better off uh, not knowing such and such because uh, you, would, you won't or you wouldn't believe it. Or to know or to be told is to be made culpable. You'd be better off not to know. The old phrase, ignorance is bliss, as they say. I've heard it said and read in some cases that I've reviewed, criminal cases. Uh, I've heard it 
said were a defendant or a co-defendant, they would say to one another, uh, maybe a co-conspirator, one of them might say, it's better for you if you don't know all the facts about this or that. You're better off not knowing. Well, there's a parable that we'll be looking at in a few weeks over in Luke 12. Um, it's called the parable of the faithful and evil servant uh, servants. And one of the teachings in that parable that we'll get to will be, to whom much is given, what? Much is required. We've heard that before. We've read it. So the bottom line is how there can be mercy in Jesus' judgment for their unbelief, that if he kept giving them truth to this people who reject the truth, it would have only increased their culpability and hence their judgment. That's some deep stuff, but it is true. So this is why within judgment of Jesus that we've been speaking about and looking at the last couple of weeks, why him speaking in riddles and parables um, was both a curse and an act of mercy. Concealing truth to those who don't want to or refuse to believe is judgment tempered with mercy so that the person won't add guilt upon guilt. Deep stuff, but it's worth thinking about. But for those who had ears to hear, Jesus said, and eyes to see, that was in Matthew 13, 16, Jesus would explain the parables. Even the chosen disciples, bear in mind, wouldn't know what they meant if our Lord didn't explain it to them. And they would ask him, Lord, what did the parable mean? Or he would offer it up and say, this is what the parable meant. Now let's make application for what all this means for us today. Because we not only have the parables in his word, but we also have the answers right here in his word. So things are doubly dangerous for unbelievers today because they have no excuse. They are without excuse because they have the truth before them available in his holy word. How many unbelievers do you think have Bibles in their homes or just refuse to listen to the gospel? Well, do you sense now maybe why Satan has wanted to destroy God's word down through the decades, the centuries, even the millennia? Why Satan wants to discredit it so much today, God's word? It's the cruel game that Satan plays to double down on the accountability and punishment that unbelievers will be subject to. And this is singularly what uh, frightens me maybe the most about where we are in America today. We've been blessed by God Almighty with revelation upon revelation of himself. We can see it in our history and even in our constitution as I've, I've alluded to many times over the last months. Blessing upon blessing. Um, David Barton and his son Tim Barton have released a new book that I'm reading right now and they talk about the golden thread of history, the referencing of providential, God's providential hand upon our country and how he protected and guided us. Um, well, we refuse to believe, I'm afraid, today. Uh, we're just like those Pharisees, I'm fearful. We smirk, we mock the truth. We refuse to believe and follow God. We've forsaken, we've abandoned God. We've walked away from him. God didn't leave us, we left him. In fact, we kicked him out of many things that we've talked about. But folks, we're calling down double punishment upon ourselves. Remember of he whom has given much, much is required. You know, I pray nearly every day that God will awaken us in our nation and bring us back to him. But unfortunately, the truth is the ball is in our court. It's our serve. You remember we looked at uh, a number of weeks ago, 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. And I hate to repeat it, but I think it's worth repeating, particularly as we see God's judgment for people that refuse to believe. Second Chronicles 7, 14, it says, If my people who are called by my name 
will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Again, the balls in our court, we're the ones that have to serve it. We have to come to God. We have to initiate the process. And it requires, number one, humbling ourselves. Americans are kind of cocky, arrogant, aren't we? Prideful. <laughs> it's hard to be humble. Number two, we have to pray and seek God's face and his will, not our will, not our selfishness. We're a selfish country today. Number three, we have to turn from our wicked ways. <laughs> wow. Wicked runs rampant, rampant in America today, doesn't it? But if we were to do those three things, I, I'll just condense it and call it those three things. It says, then God will indeed forgive our sin and will heal our land. You know, I fear we've gone too far. I fear God's judgment and wrath are here and upon us. I, uh, I hope not. I pray not. You, please pray. Pray for God's mercy upon our people, upon our nation, upon our land. Pray that people will see the light. And the light is what we're going to be talking about in this next parable, or actually the first parable that we'll be looking at. Well, the clock reminds me we're running out of time, and I haven't even gotten to our first parable. I apologize for that. But there's so much set up that I think it's important for us to understand before we dive into these parables. But I do want to read the parable today before we end, and we'll talk about it next week. This parable is rather short. It's only four verses, but it packs a punch, a powerful punch. And it goes right along, by the way, with the theme that we've been looking at, the rejection of Jesus. They refuse to believe. Their unbelief so hardened their hearts or in this case, in this parable that we'll look at here, <clears throat> maybe it'd be better to say it put blinders or scales over their eyes because their hearts were inclined to unbelief. They became blind to the truth and to Jesus. Turn to Luke 11, uh, where we'll find the parable of the lighted lamp. Some refer to it as the parable of the lamp under a basket. Um, and then some even call it, refer to it as the lamp of the body. I'm going to go to Luke 11. I'm going to change from the NIV to New American Standard for reading this. And it's verses 33 to 36 that I'll be reading. Just four power pack verses. And while you're turning there, let me, uh, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't give you my... Uh, definition of a parable, uh, which I think works. Um, we probably make the definition a little bit too complicated. I, some, I say a parable is nothing more than this. It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. That's what Jesus did. He told stories. He was the greatest storyteller of all time that they would understand and it would tune them in, but had a heavenly meaning. That's it. It was. It's that simple. And all the parables, I want to give you an insight about this that I didn't realize until a few years ago as I really started studying the parables. All parables are ultimately about the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They're all about, ultimately, salvation. If you look, if you step back, all the parables point to those things, the gospel and salvation. And over the weeks that, we'll, that, that are coming, we'll, we'll see that together. They're not about parenting. You know, I think of the prodigal son, some people say, well, that's about parenting. When it's not about being a good neighbor, the parable of the good Samaritan, parables are gospel illustrations, and we'll see that. They express theology of salvation. Okay, let us read our parable, and then next week we'll unpack it. Uh, the parable of the lighted lamp. Luke 11, verse 33. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it away in a cellar, nor under a basket, but upon a lampstand, 
so that those who enter may see the light. Verse 34, the eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is clear, your whole body also is full of light. But when it is bad, referring to your eye, your body also is full of darkness. Verse 35, then watch out that the light in you is not darkness. Verse 36, if therefore your whole body is full of light with no dark part in it, it will be wholly illumined as when the lamp illumines you with its rays. Well, it's hard not to want to dive in there because obviously the subject's about light and there's, it may seem a little bit uh, jumbled up, but it'll, it'll come because Jesus told his disciples, Jesus teaches us through the Holy Spirit. So next week, we'll look at this parable that Jesus gave and we'll consider it verse by verse and we'll let the Holy Spirit show us it's truth teaching as if Jesus were explaining it to his disciples as we read about today. In the meantime, begin praying that uh, God will illuminate this powerful parable uh, message for us in 2021. We'll give some application of that next week. Until then, be in God, be in his word, believe in Jesus and in his gospel and walk with God this week. Thank you so much for tuning in. May God's blessing be upon you. Good day.